Can everybody see the screen? Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about talk now about research strategies, your research tools and strategies, and um, I'm really interested that we have a couple students from the musicology department because one of the things I always say is uh, that the musicologists they have really great expertise in research tools. So, uh, but we're new at musicology. So. <laughs> no, okay, no, so you're also learning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, anyway, we're going to explore yeah. this, and yeah. if if anyone has anything to add, you know, let's let's uh, don't don't hold back. Hmm. Anyway, so okay, now that you you're getting close with your research questions. Uh, the way, of course, the way this works, just to go over it one more time, you've, you've had your motivation, right? You thought about your motivation. You've chosen your topic. Now we've made a first version of your research questions. And then in the next two weeks, you're going to make a reference recording. It's going to be a recording of where you are now as an artist. And it's going to be... Uh, it's not going to be a recording that answers your question. It's going to be the starting point of your question. So you play a couple, one or two movements of, uh, of the Albanese right now without making your new interpretation. And so you, all of you are going to make some sort of recording or you're going to have a method or a video or whatever. And, um, and then you're going to take that recording to your teacher and you're going to ask for their feedback related to your research question. So you're going to say, this is my research question. I'm looking into creating my own interpretation of uh, this Albanese piece. Here's my recording. Can you give me some feedback? And then they're going to say, uh, well, I think this movement could be like this. So you need to work on your articulation and your dynamics or your tempo. And, uh, and then they also might say, well, those three players are nice interpretations. But did you ever hear so-and-so's interpretation. So then the teacher is going to give you uh, some feedback. And then you take it to maybe your, you know, your colleague and you ask him what he thinks. And he says, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, uh, and then you also listen to it and you think, well, I, I also think that my phrasing is not very lyrical and I want to work on that, right? So now we have uh, a to-do list of things that we want to work on. And this is the same for all of you on the basis of the feedback of your reference recording. And then you're going to design your research. And then you're going to choose your, your met, you're going to create your methodology. And then as part of that, you're going to choose your methods. So in the methodology is the general thing like, okay, I want to, uh, I, I want to um, want to create a combination of of other you know historically informed performance uh, with a set of technical exercises to create my interpretation. I don't know. I'm making this up, right? And then you're going to say, okay, I'm going to. Uh, that means I'm going to analyze these recordings. I'm also going to create my some exercises. To, to get a certain te technique better. And I'm gonna interview my teacher from my hometown. And, uh, uh, and I'm gonna read these three articles about cello technique or piano technique, whatever, right? So now we have, on the basis of the feedback of that recording, you have the things you wanna do and then you choose the methods you're gonna to use to research. And the meth I'm gonna to talk today about what those methods are. Yeah, but for example, if our research is regarding a certain piece, uh, I don't know, and or we haven't well decided, um, do we have to play that piece that we want to do in our research? For example, in my case, I want to, um, uh, or for example, in his case, what if he doesn't still know the pieces from Albanese? Does it mean that he has to learn them in two weeks? Well, or exactly. Yeah. No, that's the well, okay. well. There are two questions there. Number one. Yeah, if you don't know the piece, well, learn it, right? Or learn the basics of it. Uh, and you guys are all masters, so you can pretty much 
okay, maybe there's a couple movements that are that you need months for. Leave those. Get started on those, but don't, you know, right now just do something, right? We just need something to start with. Mm-hmm. And we need something that's that has relevance to your research question. And I'm not sure about the piece that I want to do. For well, yeah, if your research question is about rhetorics in, in performance, mm-hmm. then you just take a piece where you can look at your rhetorics, any piece. Mm-hmm. And then and preferably something you can already play. Yeah. So that we can get to the rhetorics and not have to deal with your intonation, right? Um, and then, uh, uh, so you want to choose something that is relevant for your research question that you can already do um, in some way, and then we're going to develop from there. So with each of you, that's a different question. And for some of you, it may be the very specific piece. Maybe it's a concert from last year. Uh, it, it, maybe it's just uh, any piece so that you can start on your topic. Maybe it's a uh, it's a website with a, uh, with a, a, a learning method. Um, whatever you know, uh, you know, Eloise. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's a uh, it's a uh, maybe for you. It might even be two recordings. You know, singing and playing cello. Or something you know but somehow you want to keep it simple and you want to have it only be like you know three four minutes no no and if it's a recording of an hour and a half from last year you choose three or four minutes to send to the people right because everyone's busy and you don't need a lot of time you know we just want to watch a few moments get, get some feedback on that and on the basis of that we can get started on our method methodology okay any other questions about that? All right, let's let's move on. So, um, so then you have to think. Well, what is it that I want to know? And then you're using your feedback questions. And then what is the form of this knowledge? Is it uh, is it written? Is it in a video? Is it a method? Is it uh, in an interview? Where is it? In what form? So there we have four. The, yeah, I need to edit this. It's a little bit uh, old, this PowerPoint. But anyway, the stuff is there. Um, how can I extract it? So this is what we're going to look at, you know, and um, and the strategies and techniques depend on the, the kind of knowledge, where it is, and in what form you need it. There we have, now we have form three times. Okay. When you're getting information... There's basically two types of information you're going to be dealing with, which are qualitative and quantitative. So quantitative data is data which can be measured. And so usually it's in the form of numbers. So like, uh, um, uh, uh, I have three recordings of this uh, Albanese piece, and one person takes it at tempo 120, the other one in tempo 112, and the other one tempo 66. And so now we have a, we have like some numbers. But if you were going to say, well, the first recording, it, it really felt too fast for the phrasing. That's then a quality. So we have a difference between these these like facts, numbers, and then uh, qualities, opinions. That's qualitative. Uh, information, which is data which is observed, not measured, descriptions, opinions, stories. So someone else's subjectivity? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it could be the things that our teacher says. Well, I think you're playing too fast. Well, I think you're out of tune here, you know. Although maybe that's measurable, I don't know. that working okay let's see if that holds um, okay so we want to think about those those two types of data and what's interesting is we want to look at translating one form to the other so if you say well Avenues wrote uh, tempo 110 but everyone seems to play 120 then I think that uh, 
people are having wrong interpretations of the piece. Or I might think that Albanese was wrong, you know, right? We have all these Beethoven metronome markings which make no sense to us today. So, uh, and there's all kinds of debates about that. But it's interesting to look at the way the, the data, one form goes to the other. Um, and then that's the way we are uh, understanding the data on multiple levels. So this idea of triangulation is a, is a theme which we're going to talk a lot about today. Okay, so those are the forms of data. Now, these are the research strategies or methods in your data collection. So, and they're literature, survey, interview, case study, ethnography, and experimentation. And we're going to go through all of these one by one and talk about them. Can you see this? Survey? 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 It's like a enquête? Enquête? Yeah. I don't think this, how am I going to do that? Wait, wait, what if I do this? There we go. Okay. So, literature research. Our literature desk research, sometimes it's called. Um, so, first of all, books, articles, even websites. Right, so this is, by the way, people, people and peoples, I'm going to send you this PowerPoint. So don't feel like you have to write it up, rewrite it all. I'll send it to you. I, I would rather you be present, listen with your mind and heart, and think about it all. If there are some specific things, you, of course, take notes. And some people, they listen better when they're rewriting what's said. So you do what you want, but if... I will send it to you, just so you know. So literature, these are books, articles, websites, right? So actual printed literature. Uh, it's also recordings. So it's not just books and articles, but let's call literature recordings, videos, YouTube, all that stuff. Uh, it's also documents, such as scores, manuscripts, pictures. Uh, internet sources, which is kind of where a lot of those things come from. And so you're going you're gonna to look at all of those. You're going to read some articles. You're going to look at videos, analyze the position, whatever it is. And then you're going to talk about what you see, what you've read, and then you're going to analyze it. Say, well, uh, uh, it's a mix of different genres in the music, but actually it all is played on electric guitar, so it kind of has a sort of a rock uh, underpinning. I don't know, you know, I'm making this up, right? But that's a sort of analysis of some, uh, one way to an analyze. So you're making rules when you're analyzing, you know, theorizing, making theories about the material, which is directly related to your... Uh, research. And the inter interesting thing about literature research is like, you know, uh, I suggest a book on rhetorics, and then you get that book and you say, this is a great book, and then you look into the bibliography, and there's 20 other books on rhetorics, and then you look those up, and those are, you know, great, and then those also come from other places. So there's this kind of snowball effect once you get going. And uh, which can be overwhelming, right? So you can say, oh, now there's 40 books on rhetorics, and I don't know, you know, and that's when you have to uh, try to understand where the information is that's relevant for you and then make choices. Um, you, yeah? Where does confirmation bias come into some of this stuff? Because you know, at some point we can great, get a great book that we love because it, we agree with it, but we're not necessarily looking at things that we don't agree with. Yeah, that's true, right? Yeah. So, so how do we balance that in probably all of this stuff? Well, what was told to me is that uh, you need to, even if there's a lot of opinions out there which are different than yours, 
you need to show that they're there. They say, well, I believe this, and that's what so-and-so says, but other people all say this and this and this, and I think it's relevant because, so, right? So then you, you show that you're aware of all the different opinions out there, but then you, you also talk about why you have your opinion. Right, Got so. It. okay. Okay. Make you think of what you said before to make it debatable. Yeah. So that you yeah. can have multiple people tell, talk about it and disagree with you. Yeah. Right? Exactly, yeah. So that could be debatable. And you know, in, it, for some, some of you, you might even bring some science into your research, right? So in my research, I talk about some neuroscience and with some timing, uh, at, you know, tests and all that, studies they've done. And, and sometimes I talk about the brain and the way the brain works. And the minute you talk about the brain, and there are a lot of really smart people who say a lot of things about it, but people will say one thing and there will always be someone who says someone, something else. And then we have this mysterious organ. So it's really hard to know. So you have to just make your choices and but it's what they've suggested to me is make sure that i present that there's a nothing that i choose may which may confirm my own beliefs that doesn't mean that it's the only way thing the way it is mm -hmm. so it just make sure you 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 keep that in mind and talk about it so we have uh primary sources right so um uh, right, we talk about Quantz's book on how to play the flute. So we can go and read that book, and Quantz says this. But I can also read an article in the flute magazine of today where they quote Quantz and they talk about how they're using Quantz's information for their own opinion. So when I read Quantz, that's the primary source. And when I read what someone else says about Quantz, that's the secondary source. So you're going to come to diff two types of sources in your research. And, you know, just like playing the Urtext, right? You can play the Urtext, Ur the original version of Mozart's writing, or you can play a, a nice, cleaned, notated version with uh, articulations added, right? And uh, um, we talk about those differences, and uh, it's the same with the sources. So you may find uh, in all your research, a lot of people talking one way about quants, and then you go and read it, and you might say, well, probably, actually, I think it's something else. And so that's a sort of uh, situation where it's good to go to the primary source and you use your own interpretation of that. Okay, so that's your, 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 uh, uh, your desk research, literature, recordings, and all that. Now, so, and, and with all of you, that's going to be there, right? So we're definitely going to use, uh, uh, you're going to use literature research to get new information. You're going to use it for contextualizing your research topic. So where, what is the information that is out there in the world which relates to your topic? And if we're going to talk about how can I apply <laughs> rhetorics to my piece, my interpretation, there are books which are exactly about that. And if you don't know those books, then you may be reinventing the wheel, right? So we, want, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, we want to make a better wheel. So um, that's why we have to look at the information that's out there. And, um, and choose, and, and like I said, because of the snowball method, there'll be too much stuff, and then you have to really choose the things that are relevant to you. And with all of you, you, in the beginning, you don't know. Because you're going to be researching, you're going to see all these books, and man, a lot of them are going to be really interesting. And you're like, oh, I want to know that, and I want to know that. And yeah, it's kind of related. And, and then you're going to have this stack of things to read, and, uh, and you're going to be a year further in your research, and you haven't done anything specific. So uh, I, I think that's normal, but we also, because we, we, we are defining our research as we are doing the research. And so, um, 
I mean, in some cases, maybe if you're talking about uh, orchestral sounds on the piano, maybe it's clear what fits and what doesn't. But with a lot of our uh, topics, I mean, but you might, I don't know, even that's a topic you could, you could start reading orchestration books of orchestra and it would be like, ah, too much information. So, but at a certain point, you're going to reach that, that point of like, ah, it's too much. And that's a good moment because it's going to make you make choices, right? Just like when I put you on the spot and I make you talk about your research question, you it really focuses your your research. So um, just know that that's coming. Okay, let's move on. Survey. So yeah, in Dutch, enquête, right? Um, so this is if you want to know what a lot of people think about something. And you use a survey to get an overall picture, not what one person thinks, right? Because we, we've established that. If you ask everyone what they think, they'll tell you something different. The survey is to assess thoughts, opinions, feelings, and behavior in a general way. And generate, it generates large numbers of data, right? So you get a lot of information. And it's all, you know, like if you were going to play a piece for us, you'd have to then create 15 forms and we'd all have to fill it in. And then you'd, you'd have to collect, hand them and collect them. And then you'd have, you know, all this information. And if you asked, well, what did you think? And then everyone went to paragraph. Then you were like, ah, how can I deal with that? But if you said, um, did you understand this was about Greek symbolism? Yes or no. Then you could get an answer to that question really easily. But still, you'd have to look at 15 forms, right? Um, so we'll have to kind of think about that. You know, usually the artistic research is uh, uh, really effective with individuals. But there are cases where a survey can be uh, effective. It, you get more breadth, so more um, a broad approach than going deep. Um, you can also, it also can show you, you know, representation. So maybe this ideas of superiority, uh, maybe that's something uh, a survey could uh, uh, achieve mm -hmm. to see if pe what people, if they understand that or not, yeah. or what they understand from it. Uh, the data is processed and analyzed in a quantitative way, right? So you want to come out with numbers. That's the, the, uh, the, the best way to put together a survey. Uh, I, you know, I run a summer course, and at the end of every summer course, I send out a questionnaire. And then I ask a specific question. Um, did you think uh, the course was long enough? Yes or no? And then I, I put it under, the, under that, I put a, a, a place for comments. So then I get two types of data. I get a yes or no, and then I say, then they say, well, I think it should have been, you know, three extra days, or I think we shouldn't have taken a half day off on the Friday, or you know, and then they can talk some details, and then I can think about that. So th that's kind of a nice combination, which I like to do. Um, so with your questionnaires, you uh, you create a predetermined set of questions, right? So you write the questions. Uh, could also be a structured interview, right? So then uh, you could also, you don't have to give a piece of paper. You could also just ask 10 people. But then that would be a structured thing. Ask 10 people the same question. Uh, and then you want to see if the answer is already in your literature research and also, this is like part of your pre-research, right? So then, if you're going to make a survey, you should research it first. See if the information is already there. Uh, uh, definitely try it out to one or two people and see how it's working. Because I've seen some people make a broad questionnaire, which isn't formulated very well, and then they ask 20 people, and then they get 
it's a lot of work and it doesn't work yet, right? So then you have to prepare these well. Okay. So that's the broad approach, the survey. The interview is where you're gathering an individual's insights, right? Like you've interviewed your main subject teacher. What do you think about this? So, and then you learn their insights, their experiences. You use people from your network, right, for your interview. So this is why it's uh, helpful to be to write your network because um, sometimes you think of it, of the person and sometimes you forget uh, or you didn't think of it. And so thinking uh, uh, specifically about who's in your network related to your topic is uh, is a good thing, and to write that down. Okay, so when you're preparing an interview, you have to ask, what is it that I want or need to know? Uh, of course, with whom do I want to discuss this? Who's the person most concerned with, informed about, interested, or experienced in this topic, right? All right, we talked about that. So, um, uh, it, you know, it, if your teacher is a, a specialist in Beethoven, and you want to work on Xenakis, maybe they're not the right person to interview about Xenakis, for example. And, and that may be the case with one or two of you here. Um, but, but it could also be that they have, a, even though they don't play Xenakis, they have some nice opinions about it too. So you never know. Anyway, you prepare the conversation, the questions, the topics, ideas to trigger feedback. Of course, you make an appointment. Um, you also, you want to record if possible. So then there comes a little bit of a, uh, a thing. So you have to ask permission. Is it okay if I record this? And they say yes or no. No, I would rather you just take notes or you just listen and then you say okay. And then you do that. Or if they allow you to record it, then you have the recording. You don't share it with anybody but you transcribe it, and if it's really long, you just transcribe the relevant parts. Um, and if they make a joke, or they talk about their cat, which is irrelevant, you don't put that in the interview, right? So, uh, so you be a little bit respectful of the way people talk and the information which is relevant for your research. And I say this because <laughs> Uh, one of my students, a couple of years ago, he asked for my feedback on one of his recordings, and I, I, I spoke in the voice messages, and I was like, you know, hey, uh, yeah, how's it going? Uh, no, it was really cool to hear your recording. I hadn't heard you in a long time. I don't know. I was like just chit-chatting, and then I said some things, and he transcribed all the chit-chat, and he put that in the paper, and I was like, come on, you know. First of all, it's not in the spirit of the research, and second of all, you should have asked me before you're going to publish. Anyway, his research is not published, so it's it's not a big deal. But it's just to, so you know how that can sometimes go. And, and there was some uh, some cool stuff in there that you were surprised by, like oh, the chit chat. Yeah. No, with the chit chat, it came. It looked really silly on the page. Yeah. Right. And irrelevant. All right. it, it didn't fit. So then I'm like, and he should have known that. So uh, anyway. It, I already did the interview this week because I thought it was already, we already had. That was the assignment for last yeah, week. Yeah, yes, I, I did it. Great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I was yesterday trying to. Uh, Type it out. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult because what, some things are very, yeah. Are they important or not? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. That interview was the interview for your proposal to help you contextualize your research. Yeah. So, and you all have to do this. If you haven't done it, do it this week. And, uh, and so you do the interview, you reflect upon it, and then you talk, you know, talk about what you think about that. And I want to see that in your proposals. Do I have to, uh, oh, the questions and uh, now make a little uh, summary of his answer, or do I make one answer about the interview? Yes. 
No, one or the other. Okay. Whatever is relevant. Well, okay, whatever is relevant. Yeah. Okay. So, but that's the interview for the proposal. Now, after your proposal is uh, uh, what is that in English? Accepted. accepted. Thank you. After your proposal is accepted, you're going to start the research. And then you probably do other interviews, right? So, and you may interview your teacher again, mm -hmm. more specifically about something related to your topic. So, so just so you know, you know, that's not the only interview and you can have different purposes of the interviews. Yes, right. exactly. With the main teacher, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, like as I said before, I've never really have a main teacher. Today I'm going to combine this with the teacher I'm speaking to since it's a teacher from my old school. That's totally fine. Yeah. Maybe if you, yeah, for you guys, uh, or you know, also 3.0 doesn't have main teachers. Okay. You just have coaches and yeah, you know, too. So it's, but find someone who's I'll make, relevant. Make it work. I'll make it work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are three types of interviews. The structured interview is where you have a very specific set of questions and you don't depart from that. And then you ask the question, you get the answer, next question, answer, next question. The semi-structured interview is where you have uh, your questions and then you ask the question and then it takes you into a discussion. And there may other questions may appear based on the answers. And so then it starts to weave its way. Um, and that's probably the way all of you are going to do your interviews as a semi-structured interview. And then the open interview would be like, you know, I always give this example. Uh, if you have an interview with Yo-Yo Ma, right? Yeah. yeah, it would be really cool. And you want to hear the golden nuggets that he wants to say. But you don't want to sit down, well, what kind of rosin do you use on your bow, yo-yo? And, you know, and, and do you clip, the, you know, you wouldn't want to ask him <clears throat> some silly little piece of information because you would want to get his scrapes because it's someone with such insight and experience, right? Um, maybe you would want to ask him about his rosin, but, you know. Um, and then, and in that case, an open interview would be, okay, let's just sit down you know, and then see what he wants to talk about and go with that. But uh, in this case, uh, you guys have a, a research and, you know, you're really going for specific things. So you want to go into an interview with some questions prepared and then see what they say, follow it up. And then when it kind of comes to a, an ending, you get your next question. And then sometimes that question's already been answered and you skip to the next one and so forth. So, but, but you don't want to have the situation that later that night you're like, oh God, I forgot to ask this or this, right? Make sure that all the, the things that you want to know are written down so that you can get to them. And, uh, uh, and that's uh, really a, a thing because, you know, interviews will really start to take their own direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you want to make sure you've got, just like if you're giving a speech or you're talking about a subject, you want to have the, the points there to help guide you through it. Because if I had to remember all these points, I, I would also forget half of them. I mean, might sometimes be um, nice if you're, I mean, I guess it's logical, but if you're in an interview, just check if you had all your questions answered. Sometimes, even to the person I'm speaking to, I'm summarizing what the person replied to me. Yeah. And sometimes I didn't hear something correctly. And like, oh, no, no, I did not mean that. I mean this. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's good to know. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Repeat Just reflect what they say. In the interview itself, so that afterwards you're not like, oh, <laughs> you know? Because then you're still able to ask these questions. Yeah. That's a good one. So you summarize what was said and yeah. see if they agree with that. Yeah. Uh, well, here's an idea of a didactic interview. Uh, um, dyadic. Oh yeah, dyadic. You're right. That may now it makes sense. I was wondering why is that didactic? It's dyadic. Dyad meaning two people or two things. So interviewing two people at the same time. So 
maybe that's relevant for some of you that there are two people you want to get them interacting on a topic and then uh, you want to steer that um, you can also do a focus group discussion right so that's kind of what we're doing now when we're talking about the research uh, this is a more widely used practice that could have place for instance in researching involving choirs or orchestras Right, so maybe you get together with a bunch of musicians and ask for uh, their feedback on the clarity of your beats or something like that. Okay, let's move on. Case study. Yeah, we gotta move on. Uh, so this is also a really common one which a lot of you might use. So I'm gonna make a case study of the way this pianist plays uh, Iberia. And so I'm gonna analyze their tempi. I'm gonna look at their their articulations, blah, blah, blah. And so this is uh, where you're going to gain profound insight into this topic, into the subject. So let's really look at what they're doing. Um, so you're going deep with a yeah, small number of research units, labor intense. So you're really going to uh, uh, look at the details of the case that you're looking at. Uh, it's more you're going deep instead of broad. And, uh, and you're selecting very specific examples, right? So you're not going to take uh, uh, 10 different pianists. No, you're going to take one pianist and you're going to look at what they do. And you're going to say why, because I think that that's really relevant for my research. And then I'm going to really get into uh, the way that's working. You know, or if you're, if you're researching uh, singing and playing violin at the same time, you're not going to just choose all the violinists. No, you're going to choose a violinist who's, uh, who's singing and playing, right? So your selection. Um, uh, the data is, is um, quality data, so it's qualifiable data, which... Uh, which is more, uh, it's not numbers, but qualities, meanings. Uh, and then we're looking to have a, a, an understanding of it. Specific understanding, not a generalized one. Um, when you're studying your case, you're not going to just look at one thing. You're going to look at multiple aspects of that case study. So not only how they play, but what is the repertoire, how, um, I, you know, just you might, if the person is living, you might also uh, interview them. So you have a recording, you analyze, you analyze the recording, you interview them, uh, and you may also want to try to play like them, right? So then you have all these different methods to understand the way someone does something. That's what's triangulation. Um, right, so we have interviewing, observation, literature research. Okay, so that's the case study. Um, like, I think it's probably also relevant for most of you people, most of your research topics, to look at how someone is doing uh, something related to what you want to do. So it's a good way to uh, really understand it and become an expert on their way. So that when you're teaching, you say, well, you know, when Heifetz was singing and playing, you know, he always uh, sang out of the side of his mouth. And... Uh, and someone, you know, you become an expert in that. Okay. Ethnography. If the knowledge you seek is implicit and exists only in the knowledge, experience, and behavior of a specific group of people. Right? So if you're, you know, typically, we, you know, this is where ethnomusicology comes from, right? They wanted to not only look at uh, uh, dead white guys from the Europe and their, and their notated compositions, but they wanted to go into the, the Wolof uh, uh, tribe 
village in, in Senegal and, and see the way drumming works. And then you go into the village and it's not just rhythms and instruments, it's a whole culture. And it's, a, it's, it's learning about uh, what the function of the, the drumming is in the society and how they use it and, and all these things. And, uh, and it's probably a, a lot about the hierarchy dynamics of the different drummers in the ensemble and, and all that stuff. So you go and you live in the village for a month and you learn all of that stuff, right? So that would be your typical ethnography. However, uh, I don't know if we have any, you know, those kinds of non-Western topics here today, but even studying, you know, uh, 18th century performance practice is ethnography, right? So then you're talking about a group of people which is, uh, has a location and a time, right? So uh, we can, even if you're talking about, a, you know, studying Zanakis today, or studying Albanese today, it's going to be different than the way it was 80 years ago. So this concept of ethnography, it's not just a sort of non-Western kind of thing. It's also there is an ethnography to most of our topics. And so you want to contextualize that and talk about that. So it would, could be looked at as a smaller subset of bigger set, like exactly. music teachers that just do global groove music or yeah. pop music. Or exactly. Versus everything. Or, yeah. You look at the cultural context of a certain period of time and see why yeah. it did came to be like that. Connection to what, how it was performed, in what context, what places, yeah. 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 Um, and then a, a sub-branch of ethnography um, is called autoethnography, which is then the study of your culture. So if we take that idea of, of, of ethnography, we can apply it to you. And you have a location where you come from, and you, you have teachers you studied with, and you have recordings, you, and you have an instrument. And so you actually, everyone has their own ethnography. And usually we don't, I, I mean, an, we don't talk about autoethnography in artistic research because artistic research is completely about autoethnography. It's like by definition autoethnography because we want to know what your context is, what are your thoughts, and then you talk about your motivation, your experiences, and that's that's the the, the ethnography of you as an artist, and that gives the the context for your artistic ideas. Um, and your experiences. Well, I experienced it like this, and this is the way I thought of this. And so that's, that's your autoethnography. Oh, I have a... Describing a culture, complex subconscious processes, field work, we talked about that. You're in the midst of what you're studying, techniques, observation, participating, interviewing, documentation, participation again. Okay, so th those are the kind of the hallmarks of ethnography. And now we come to experimentation. So, and I think this is also going to be a part of most of your, your researches. This will be one of your methods. And we have different types of experiments. Experimentation, parametric experimentation, quasi-experiment, and self-experiment. And so this is how you generate your own data, right? So experimentation data is obtained by intervening in or manipulating situations or processes, right? So you're, try, you're ch checking out bowing techniques for your Mozart sonata, and then you're experimenting with a heavy bow or a light bow, and you're just trying things out. You're, making, you're intervening and manipulating the situation and seeing what the results are. Um, now, if we want to talk about scientific experiments, right, then usually we talk about, you know, the, the study group and the control group, right? So, uh, and then we come to, yeah, scientific experiment, which is usually not something that we, uh, we do so much in the artistic research. 
for. We don't need to come to that kind of objective truths that will come out of scientific research or even universal truth. But we want to come to subjective truths. So you, you could say, well, this is how it works for me. Um, and that's where we get this idea of quasi-experiment, right? So it's not proof, but valuable ideas that can be worked out or tested. So for me, if I, if I, uh, if I have a loose wrist, it really helps the lightness of my articulation. Okay, that's something we can test. And so you, you get a buddy and you say, yeah, you, you grab it with the, with the Russian style of holding the bow. What if you do like a French style and then you use a loose wrist? How does that work? And then they try it out and then you see if it works, right? So that would be a, this is sort of quasi experiment. And this is really what you guys will be doing in your experiments. It's an exper experimentation which is related directly to your practice. Or I'm going to make uh, uh, several different methods to, to teach Groove, and we'll try it out with a couple people each and, and see what the results are. Right? Um, OK, so that would be, those are group experiments. And then I also talked about the self-experiment. So how does it work for you? And then, this is an interesting one, the parametric experiment, which is a systematic permutation of variables. So let's say we're, we're looking at uh, bowing. Keep this one up. And I can hold the bow with the, with the Russian bow arm. I can hold it with, uh, let's say, European bow arm. Uh, uh, and I can hold my wrist like this. I can hold my wrist like this and I can have the elbow up or down, right? So now we have, we have three variables with two options, let's say. So now I'm gonna do Russian bow, wrist down, elbow down, and then I make a recording. And then I'm gonna do Russian version, wrist down, elbow up, I make a recording. Now I'm gonna do uh, uh, Russian bow, wrist up, elbow down, make the recording, and then elbow up make the recording. And then I'm gonna do European bow arm, wrist and elbow down, you get it, right? So this is systematic permutation. And the reason we do this, in some cases, is because you grab your violin and you say, oh yeah, it's obviously uh, the European bow with the wrist up and the elbow up is gonna give me lighter articulation. And you don't even try the other ones. So, and then you, let's say you do the parametric, and then you say, well, you know what, actually, with my elbow down, I'm much more relaxed, and then I can actually do a lighter articulation, right? So the parametric experiment is a systematic way to look at all the possibilities and to be able to try them out, because most often you discover things that you didn't know were there. And I do this all the time in my composing. I, I write a bunch of possibilities and I try them all out. And you know, it's a, it's, it's a much better way than just always taking your first choice. But I'll just say one more thing. But, it, but you also have to be careful with the parametric. Because if you say, well, uh, I'm going to do those six different ways uh, in all 24 keys, then all of a sudden we have six times 24 times experiments. So the parametric, it can explode into like way too many possibilities. So you have to, you have to choose your variables carefully. Richard. What if you take, you're taking a phrase doing exactly what you just did and by the sixth time though, you practiced it six times and of course the sixth one's gonna maybe be better because you have everything down. <laughs> How do you then figure that into that? Type of a thing. Well, because I don't think that's what you're looking for. Well, I don't know, but if I'm presenting a method to a class and I can do it six different ways, but the sixth class, I've learned so much. Well, I know it's a really good question, and uh, and that's one of the challenges in the artistic research, is to show that you got better through the research you did, and not just because you were practicing for a year and a half. So back to that objectivity and everything else that comes into play. Yeah. Yeah.
maybe keep enough separation between your methods to yeah. not take too much from one lesson to the other. Yeah, yeah and probably also you'd have to design it so that it's not about, it's not a situation where when you get better you can, that it changes the experiment. Oh yeah, That's, yeah. So, you got the equation. yeah, so you, you want to reduce it to somehow where it's not about technique but about the position of your, your body in this case. Yeah. So, so you have to, th you guys have to figure that out. Um, uh, and then the, the other way uh, to experiment, which is really great, is reenactment. So this is where you maybe want to try to play, play this sonata with the, the exact approach to uh, rubato that Polini takes in his recording from 1978. And so then you listen to it and then you try to play it, right? And then you would say, wow, it feels really strange the way he takes a, a, a rubato here and funny that the left hand goes before the right hand, you know, whatever. So you, this reenactment can really teach you a lot about the way someone plays. Um, or reenacting someone else's teaching style, or trying to perform a piece by uh, David Bowie in the way he does it, right? So you might, and seeing how the audience responds, you might learn a lot that's directly relevant for your research. So the reenactment could be a really nice tool for a lot of you. Um, but it could also be that some of your research topics, no one's ever done anything like that. So. You're, you're charting into new territory and there's no one that you can reenact. And it says here, in combination with reflexive writing. Reflexive? Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, what's the difference between reflexive and reflective, right? <laughs> right, so... A reflective is when you're you're, you have something and then you're reflecting upon it. So I've reenacted this and uh, I've, decided, I've learned that it's, um, uh, uh, people respond to my performance, right? Or I feel like it doesn't work for me, or I feel like, uh, uh, yeah, it's funny, yeah? Uh, reaction? A reaction, that's a good one. Thank you, Paula, yeah, so it's reacting. Whereas reflexive, right, we know this from reflexive verbs, they point to yourself. So in a way, all of our reflecting is reflexive. But uh, there, I'm sure there are, you know, reflecting is when you're just thinking about what happened and reacting, saying what your thoughts are. Reflexive is when you're directly relating it to yourself and your practice and your what you do. So that's also a key point, like the autoethnography. It's, it's about you. Um, but like, for example, you know, if you interview someone and they say, well, you know, you could, you could do it like this or like that or like that, you could reflect upon those options and say, well, I think number, you know, the second one is more relevant for me because of this topic, right? So that would be reflecting upon an interview and then using that to, to take decisions. Whereas reflexive would be like, well, I've tried them all out. And, uh, and playing it like this just doesn't work for me because I have too much tension here and you know, then it's directly related to you and your situation. Okay. Oh, we're actually done. So uh, um, we didn't get to the strategies, but we will, we will get to this uh, next time. Um, so what I want you guys to do, okay, now we don't have class for two weeks, right? We skip next week, and then we meet in two weeks. That should be on the list. Um, I would love it if you could already make your reference recording or plan it out. If you're not sure, talk to your teacher. And then your reference recording, uh, use your phone Use a microphone if you're tech savvy, set up the whole thing. Uh, but we need to have some recording 
which where we can see what you do in a clear way, see and hear or look at, and uh, and then, so let's, number one, get that, make the recording, and uh, uh, in the next two weeks, and then if you have time, you can already send it to your teacher and a couple of colleagues or friends or experts from your network and get your feedback. Like I said, that's going to be on the basis of that feedback, that's how we're going to design the research. And then we can talk more about that. It was a little bit the end, but uh, that's okay. We'll, we'll be talking about this for the next few weeks. Okay, any questions? So the next week we have the recording and uh, feedback. Yeah. For the, next week. for the next two weeks. Oh, yeah. And, and I have a question for you guys. Uh, some of you have sent me your assignments. Would you like to do that and have me look at them? Well, until now, I haven't specifically asked, you know, I'm giving you homework, but I haven't asked you to send me your homework. Hmm. Uh, uh, in a way, I'm teaching the research skills, and you also have your mentor, but uh, uh, who you should be talking to about your research. But if you want, we can, we can kind of crystallize that process and say, okay, all of you send me your re reference recordings. Uh, by uh, Monday in a week and a half, something like that. Oh, that seems right. And then I can have a look at it and give you some feedback on it. Or we can do it in class that everyone brings it on and they show us a little bit on. Actually, I think that's better. <laughs> let's do that. Yeah, let's do it in class. I, just like today, it was good to see. Um, if, so let's do that. You bring, make your reference recording and you bring it and you show us a little bit, talk about it. Uh, if any of you would like specific feedback on anything, you just send it to me, and, uh, and then I will get to that in a number of days. Yes? Awesome. Okay, guys. See you in two weeks.